Danknet approached me last year to ask if I would work on this project with him. Well, I was blown away, as you can imagine. He works alone. But he came to me in mid-2020 and said that there was a short list of content creators he was considering to help him on the story, and I was his first choice. I immediately put everything else on hold, said dear god yes, and got to work. While digging into it, I was put in touch with a gentleman named Patrick, who had spent much of his youth in the Bahamas and was in fact friends with Kai Nygaard, Peter Nygaard's older son. Patrick had a lot of valuable insight with first-hand accounts of the parties that were held at the home of the Mega Millionaire. These were the very parties where much of the bad behavior Peter Nygaard is being accused of is said to have occurred. The fascinating thing you'll find is Patrick does not confirm all that is being alleged. At times, his recollection seems to contradict the official story. In any case, I have done my best to edit myself out of the interview so Patrick's story can be told. At the end of the day, Patrick's story is a fart in the wind when compared to the grand story of Peter Nygaard. As an addendum to Danknet's video, I feel it will entertain those immersed in the Nygaard tale. It is certainly a tasty morsel while we wait for the next Danknet chapter to drop. To the subscribers of Danknet who have taken a gamble and subscribed to me as well, bless you, welcome, and I pray I can entertain you half as well as Danknet. Enjoy. My family lived in the Bahamas um, from my father. My grandfather moved there in the 70s. Okay, okay. my parents met there. So I wasn't born there, but I was conceived there. My brothers were conceived there. And my mom, you know, had me in Europe. So she's European. So so I was born in Europe. And my father um, is, is Irish, actually, Irish-American. Uh, and then we moved um we lived, um, we lived in the Bahamas uh, growing up as kids, but we didn't live in Life or Key. We lived on the other side of the island. We, lived, um, we had a big house up there, and big guarded kind of gate and big backyard and pool and all that. Well, my grandfather was alive, and then when he passed away, we moved to Europe. <clears throat> yeah. And then we came back. Well, when we came back to the Bahamas, it was um, my mother who wanted to move to Life or Key because she didn't feel safe because apparently we had been, well, my parents had been robbed um, when we lived in the other place on the other side of the island, which was not a gated community. It was just, we lived in a big house up on a hill on the other side of the island. So that was it. So we had left the Bahamas after my grandfather died. We went to Europe for a few years and then we came back. Um, in 1991, I think it was, we moved to Life or Key. So previously I had lived in the Bahamas, but I hadn't lived in Life or Key. I was first introduced to Kai Nygaard in uh, and life for well, it was life for key. It was now 1995, 96. Uh, I went to boarding school, Canada. So I wasn't living in life for key full time. I was returning on holidays, vacation, Christmas, March break, and summer. So I was back for those periods of time. So I was back on my holiday, and my best friend who lived next to me had made a lot of friends on the island because I was away in school. So one day I was with my best friend and. Uh, he said, dude, man, I, um, you have to come uh, with me. And I said, where are you going? And he goes, I'm going to Nygaard Key. I said, what do you mean you're going to Nygaard Key? I was like, to how, who do you know? He goes, oh, he goes, look, it's a long story, but I'm friends with his son. I met his son at a party. And I was like, oh, cool. And he, I go, what's he like? He goes, yeah, yeah, he's cool. Yeah, he's cool. And I was like, all right, cool. So we go to Nygaard Key. We drive over in his golf cart, my best friend, and we ring the door, ring the bell at the gate. And my friend asks for Kai. And they, they say, yeah, Kai's here. And they open the gate. We drive in and, you know, Kai comes down from the giant treehouse, wherever he was, comes walking down. And my friend introduced me and I introduced myself. And he's, and we just, you know, as kids, we go into kid stuff. So we kind of, kind of exploring the whole Nygaard key and he's showing us around. He's like, yeah, yeah, this is what my dad's been building. And he was pretty open, like within 10, 15 minutes. He's like, yeah, yeah, let's go up here and let's do this and I'll show you around. And he had two sisters. I know his two sisters. And, uh, you know, I, I knew that they had a father had divorced his mother and she had cancer in the States. And I knew I found that out later. So I didn't know that at the start. But, you know, underneath it all, maybe Kai is uh, resentful or upset towards his father, be leaving his mother with cancer and all that stuff. But she was well looked after. That's how she was able to afford the treatment to recover, you know. So 
he can say what he wants, but he didn't walk away and leave her with nothing. He obviously took took care of her. After obviously being introduced to Kai, you know, a few times, um, I met Kai outside of the key as well. Going to Nygaard Key, yeah, we started going there. And I started going there in the summer um, in 96, going to beach parties, volleyball parties, uh, barbecues, any excuse for a party that my, his father would have. And if Kai was there, you know, I was going, you know. So obviously got to meet his sisters and then, you know, Kai introduced me all, oh, by the way, this is his friend, uh, so-and-so or whatever. So I would meet his sister. I met his sisters and, you know, they were pretty cool. They were down, they seemed down to earth. They seemed okay, you know. Now, I didn't try to hit on any of them, but they had boyfriends at the time. I think one of my friends was going out with one of the, one of his daughters. They seemed fairly normal. So, but when I got a bit older, like when I was there, maybe the next year, maybe 97, 97, 98, I was there during the daytime and I was went to see Kai and with my friend and we were walking around the key. Every time I went there, his dad's building something new, you know, so it's, it's always something new to look at. He seemed to be pretty hands on. That's probably why I didn't see a lot of him. You know, he was always involved and with his Mayan architecture and building his nightclub and building this and building that. I mean, he changed a lot of things a lot of times. I mean, I remember he had a pool. If you look at the map of Nygaard Key, he had a pool, he had like a saltwater pond. It was very at the very tip of it where the water comes in. There's a reef there, and he had dolphins in there, if I remember. But he was, I don't know if he, he wasn't legally allowed to keep them, but he had dolphins in there. Like, can you coming. confirm, to your knowledge, can you confirm that there was a, a fish tank for humans, like some sort of big glass wall, perhaps, that you could see people swimming or something? Yeah, yeah, that's 100% true. I'll, I'll tell you about that a bit later because gotcha. it was you. It was used more in the nighttime. If you catch my drift for the evening parties, women would swim in there with uh, little to nothing on. I was in Nygaard Key, and I was at the backside of Nygaard Key, but I was up in the main house. Like It goes up, like there's different levels. And I was walking back down. I was trying to figure out how to get, get out, but I was by myself. And one of Nygaard's models, who was in a bikini and high heels, was walking up the same path, but she stopped. She said, oh, what, what are you doing? Or, you know, she just introduced herself. And I said, oh, I was just here with Kai and I'm just walking around, just chilling out. She's like, oh, I'm not doing anything. I, I'm, I'm kind of bored. I'm, do you want to come hang out with me? And I said, okay, sure. And she said, let me show you around. She says, so I said, sure, why not? She took me around a few places. And then she goes, oh, let me show you where I'm staying. So I won't go further into that, but I guess you can uh-huh. guess where that went. So there were few other times that happened but different in different ways not the same way um that was just maybe an isolated incident um well at least for myself at the time it was kind of shock and awe but a very nice shock and awe i was at another party and then yeah there was a there's a party one night and it wasn't too big of a party but there were some girls there was obviously women around there weren't a lot of people around and to be honest i don't even know if mr nygaard was there i never saw him that night uh, maybe he was, maybe he was away or something, but there were a few girls there and they looked bored and uh, they were in the jacuzzi, the hot tub, and they were playing, playing games, drinking games. So myself and my friend and Kai showed up and the girls said, Oh, Hey guys, what are you doing? Blah, blah, blah. You know? And they said, you want to join us? So we all jumped in the hot tub and we ended up having playing, you know, sex games in the tub, which as I think they had told you, they led, led to, you know, going ending up in the whatever bedrooms they were staying in because he had so many bedrooms in the house it was ridiculous you know another incident that happened was i was with kai and my friend and there were there was a model that walked up to us another time and kai just said all right guys nice to see you uh come by you know come by tomorrow or something like that give me a call or whatever that type of way and we were like yeah yeah cool and uh, he went off with a model so she came up to him so gotcha no there was only one of them so at, at that time so obviously he wasn't just going off with her for no reason. He was at least 15 or 16 at the time. So, you know, so there was no, nothing being forced. Now I didn't see anything, but obviously, you know, nice girl in high heels and bikini, he's not just going off, leaving. He's, he's of course, he's going to leave his buddies to take care of himself. I would, if I was him, <laughs> put it that way. I'd say, guys, I'll see you later. Give me a call. The hot tub incident. Um, like I said, it was just not a lot of people around that night, but there were a few girls there and they looked bored or there wasn't anything really going on, but <clears throat> we came to hang out. So, which is fine. And like I said, we were got in the hot tub, we were drink, having drinks and stuff like that and having fun. And 
girls started to play games, sex games, and one thing led to another. And, you know, I, I left with one of the girls and to her room and Kai left and my friend left to the other girl's room. So, you know, there's current coming back to the present situation. Like if Kai is saying that, um, I don't know if it's Kai who's saying it, but, you know, Kai was well into it, you know, but Kai was getting into the thing. Like, I mean, for him, it was right. great, you know, getting to go down to his dad's mansion or palace, you know, on his holidays, whenever he was allowed to go. And he had all these models around him. Of course, you're the kid's son. Of course, these women are going to want to work their way up the ladder, huh? You had a, an anecdote about basically showed that uh, Nygaard was not a big fan of drugs. Can you tell that story again? So to be honest, this is uh, not from first hand. This is second hand because right, yeah. I was actually there. So I like to be factual about it. Gotcha. But uh, my best friend was there, and I know he wouldn't have lied to me because he would have told me, you know. So him, he was there with Kai, and there was a party or something. I, I don't think I was – I think I was away at the time or wherever I was. I could have been on the island, but I could have been – at Atlantis on Paradise Island because my cousin always stayed there. So whatever, wherever I was, I wasn't mm -hmm. there. But I know that my best friend was there and he told me that they got really drunk in Kai's and one who can hold his liquor very well. My friend can't, my friend can drink like a fish. Uh, <laughs> but at a young age, he was drinking a lot down there. So he just told me, oh, dude, man, Kai passed out in his room and I was panicking because his dad was looking for him and you know, blah, blah, blah. So I had to wake him up and I use your dad's candle light tricker. I put a lighter under his hand to shock him, to wake him up, you know, and try to get him in a cold shower and all that. Shit. So his dad came in and thought that Kai and my friend were using drugs and he was very, very, very adamant to the fact he goes, I will not tolerate drug use at all ever on my property or anywhere. And, and, and I was like, oh, really? Because Jim, my friend said to me, oh, yeah, you know, Mr. Nygaard came in and he fucking went livid at Kai. And he goes, you better not be on fucking drugs. If I find out you're on drugs, I'm sending you back to your mom's in the States. That's it. You know, he's putting down the foot, like saying, like, I don't tolerate. I have zero tolerance policy for drugs. Women, That's booze, fine, but no drugs. Can you give me your take on Nygaard? Like, um, what was your take on him overall, if you had to take um, overall, I mean, I, like I said, I met the guy a few times, never had anything bad to say about the guy. I mean, he let me come into his property and use his facilities and has obviously had some fun with his girls, whether he knew about that or not. But, you know, I, I don't think he gave a shit, to be honest, because, you know, eh, any of the girls going there, you know, obviously, I mean, think about it, they're getting, he had his own jet, so they were flying, he was paying for all their expenses, paying the paying for them to come there and paying for all. So he had a lot of bills to pay. So it was a free holiday in a luxury mansion, you know, like anyone would die to do that, you know? So the fact that anybody got invited there, like, you know, you know, they, you know, I don't know if the girls thought they were going to get freebies, but there's nothing for free in life. I've learned that very young, but as a man, it's different because a man, you have to earn your value as a woman. If you're good, born with good genes, your the social market value is there. So, if you're born with good genes, you know, you, you know, still there's a price. I mean, as you know, like has said, there's no such thing as a golden vagina. But you know, maybe all these girls thought it was a free ride. But <laughs> you know, you know what I, what I would say is that uh, you know, if uh, these women did have to, you know, spread their, you know, they had to spread their, but they were all doing it for a reason to climb a ladder. They all thought they were going to be famous because of his brand use his name and brand and become a model under their brand her, his brand and then become famous off of it so but again it was his hard work it was his perseverance his creativity the guy's an absolute genius like i spoke to him a couple times about just ask, i asked him basic questions about his you know his fashion his clothes lines and the guy's a genius like his brain it's not just one side left or right he had the ability to use both and put them together and he could identify problems, how to solve them. He could engineer products to solve that product problem. Sorry, and yeah. that's what he did. He liked to, and that what women were the whole focus of his business his whole life. So he studied them periodically. He had to, you know, the average woman who would have been a size ten or twelve or fourteen. He was trying to say, well, how can I make them look like an eight or maybe a seven or a six? You know, can I? What can I design for them? So he was. 
that's how his creativity was. But hey, you know, yeah. he's a man just like any other man. And, you know, I never saw any undo or towards any women, you know. You know, how many times would you say that you witnessed a party in full swing? Because, like, the pictures that have come out of there it's always with, like, these girls grinding on each other that they they look oh. like they might be young, but they got their faces blurred out. And so I think that's doesn't look good for him. But what did you witness no, and look, how many times I mean, did you look, say? I mean, look, I went to loads of parties, you know, and there uh, I can't tell you how many, to be honest. Um, and a lot of them were different. A lot of them were with my friends and, you know, the girls, girls that were there as well, friends of mine. And they were young. They were in their teenage years, but they were there maybe dancing on the stage. And, you know, when when he got his night like nightclub up is running, I was at the millennium. I went to his millennium party in 2000 in the nightclub, you know, and me at all. You know, there was I, you know, there was a lot of most of them were older to me. They all looked older to me because I was young. You know, they all looked like they were 18. But, you know, there are a lot of women that can hide that, you know, whether they're 16 or 17, they can look like they're 18. Just depends how a woman looks. She can get away with it with some makeup and high heels and the right, and she has the right looks. You know, she can get away with it. Like a lot of my, like even I said, like a lot of my friends, like some of the girls would have been 15, 16, and they could have passed for 18 as well. And they did. They went to nightclubs in the Bahamas and they got away with it. They didn't get ID. Like I'd get ID and I'd have a fake ID <laughs> to get in, you know. Mm -hmm. So if I need, I had one, you know. I mean, to be honest, the experiences that while I was there, and there must have been at least a dozen times I was there for parties, like actual parties, you know, in the evening time when there were a lot of women there and they were in their late mid twenties, late twenties, that age, like early, early twenties to mid twenties to late twenties, all that age, all in their, well, you know, girls more in their prime, you know, in their early late twenties, that type of stuff. Right, right. So I, I never, I never, and I would have been a lot younger than them. So I would have never seen, like I said, unless like some, sometimes like there was one party like he had in the summer and he invited everybody who was there like lived in the Keys and like my, like I said, a lot of my friends like there were, they had like my, there were girls my age and they came as well, you know, and they would have been dancing up on the stage and stuff like that. And they would have been drinking and partying just like any other kid would have been, you know, uh, there's this giant tree house, like, you know, a mansion tree house and bar, you know, free drink and free, you know, free everything. So why not? It was just another party. Like that's all. It was sure. just at night. It was just a lovely party in Nygaard Key. That's all it was. And, I can't say anything, anything more than that, because that's just the facts. That's just what happened. I didn't witness anything at any party that would have, that I would have seen as assault or sexual abuse or this right. whole thing of this whole class action lawsuit that bewilders me uh, is this the nonsense about this trafficking. How was he sex trafficking? Was he running a prostitution ring? You know, because all of these women want got jobs through Nygaard's, like his companies. They all wanted to be a model or an actor. They all wanted to be involved in wearing his fashion line, his brand that he he created from his hard work, from his sweat and blood for years. Right. So they all wanted to join the fucking gravy chain. Pardon my language. And I'm not sexist. They all just wanted to join the gravy chain and get a free ride. So nothing's for free. So, I mean. Look, and as is, as I may have said to you before, and I'll say it again on record, that any woman going there and everything getting comp for free, and if they were told that he was going to make them into a star, uh, model, whatever for his brand, and then they were going to be able to go off and make you, you know, and use his name and his his brand as leverage to create their own image and their own brand out of his. You know, there, there's a there's a price. And if they were dumb enough to believe that they were going to get that for free, well, that's all their fault because nothing's for free. And if they agreed to have intercourse or do special favors or whatever they did with him, okay, then they did it for a reason because they wanted to get something from him because he was the one who had things to offer to people. What were they going to offer to him? You know, they've got to pay the piper. Sorry. they got to pay for it. So if they're expecting a free ride, they're wrong. And if they didn't get what they wanted and now they're being spoiled little girls because they can't 
They didn't get what they want or they didn't get what they told they were getting. And they didn't sign a contract that says, oh, you know, if you come to Nygaard Key, I'm going to um, I'm going to make you famous. OK, so that's their own stupidity. And then when they come around now with this ex trafficking and this class action lawsuit, it's all bull. They're all they, this is Bacon who pushed it. See, once Bacon got once Nygaard got into trouble by dredging his property illegal and Bacon did it too illegally. Bacon dredged his property, and Nygaard did, but Bacon didn't get in trouble. And then Nygaard got in trouble with the Bahamian government. So now Bacon, you know, now Nygaard didn't show up to court. His lawyers dealt with it, and then basically, you know, he got fed up with it, and he left and went to Canada. It was only when he, when Bacon got Nygaard, this is what I believe, when Bacon got Nygaard to Canada, he figured he could start throwing a lawsuit from New York, and that's where Bacon's based. That's where more capital is. That's his, where his hedge fund is. So he's got a lot of connections and a lot of money and power there. The guy's uh, you know worth a couple billion or 1.5, 1.8 billion, whatever it is, and he manages about 10 billion, but whatever it was. But you know he's very you know very powerful guy, one of the top 20 fund managers in the world. I think you sure. know his return, his returns were about 17, 18 percent on average for 30 years. So they're very high, and um, you know, he'd have a lot of weight and a lot of pull. So I mean, New New York would have logistically and position for the right place for him to, you know, back a couple of people to say that, you know, oh, Nygaard touched me and he hit me and he harassed me and, he, you know, he did this to me. So, right. you know, and because Nygaard has that lifestyle, he's the fashion mogul, mogul with a jet and a giant mansion and a party tree house in the Bahamas, you know, catering to women. Then women all want to get something off of him. Well, why can't it just be an exchange? I mean, I guarantee this. There are a lot of women who went back for seconds thinking that, oh, you know, maybe if I do what he wants, or, you know, maybe any extra favors that he likes more, that he might do something more for me and help me. So I'm sure there's a lot of women that will promise a lot of things, and they did things, but Nygaard didn't deliver. Is that illegal? No. In no court of law, in any court, in any world, that is not illegal. This is where I come back to Bacon. I think Bacon goes, okay, he's a smart guy. He's a hedge fund guy. So like, how do I destroy him? He goes, well, I know Peter likes his women. He's a bit of a smart man. Well, what's wrong with that? You know, Peter loves his women. That's his vice, you know, but it's his business. He has to study them. He has to know everything about them because he produces products for them, you know, and they want to get right. famous off of him. So he's doing them a favor is how I see it. And meanwhile, Nygaard, you know, the Canada, because he has to leave the Bahamas because he, he can't go back there because there's a arrest warrant out for him. Then he gets attacked in Canada because that way, see, Bacon knew he was trapped. He had nowhere else to go. So that was easy way to launch a lawsuit from the U.S. where he's based. And he knows Nygaard also has his uh, headquarters in Times Square. So he knows he's all over the place in, in Canada, but he figured he could attack him in New York and break him down there and then try to build the so-called allegations and rape and assault and all that against him you know like obviously i'm defending nygaard i'm defending nygaard on what i know what i've seen you know and right. like i said I've, I've seen like i've seen a lot of things in my life i probably i shouldn't have seen but regardless the facts are i never saw anything of that and even uh, of like any undoing sexual undoing like rape, sexual harassment or anything like that you know and going back to his son um, is whether it was Kai who said he was, I don't think Kai said he, he was, but Kai said he had a couple brothers and one was a sex worker was pushed on him in Niger Cave. And I don't know if that's true, but, um, Kai, Kai had his fun with those girls. I did. The first time I met Dan, I met him as Dan, the fisherman, Dan, the fisherman. That's how I met him. <clears throat> so. It was back, it was before I met Kai Nygaard, it was been about 94, 93, 94, because um, ba Lewis Bacon bought a couple of houses down in a little, there's a little marina, a little cove inside Clifton Bay. And uh, ba Lewis Bacon had a couple of houses there and he had a really lovely speedboat, powerboat, a Magnum. And at the time it was like, you know, nobody had that boat in Lightford Key. People had cruise boats and they had some big yachts and, they had some sports fishermen. That was kind of the standard. That speedboat was was one of a kind, you know. 
And Dan was obviously, Dan was a seaman. He knew fishing, he knew boats, he knew the water, you know. And obviously, Bacon hired him for that expertise. So, but Dan had a great job. Dan had uh, got to play with Bacon's toys. And Bacon was never there. He was running a hedge fund in New York. So he'd only come down on the weekends or on holidays or when he could. <laughs> and Bacon also had houses all over the place, you know. When I first saw Dan, Dan appeared on the Magnum in Leipzig Marina. And anyone could walk around that marina. And there were loads of boats there. So I first saw the Magnum there. And that's when I saw Dan on the boat and said, oh, man, that's a cool boat. What is that? That That's, you know, how I would have started the conversation as far as my recollection goes to that that story. So, so Dan know, would have been um, roughly twice your age or something, like in his 30s or? Oh, God, yeah. 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 I was only a kid. I was like 13 or 14. You know, I'd been riding my bike around the marina. and uh, I saw the boat before. But then I got to see him on the boat, so I said, oh, what is that? And how many horsepower is it? How fast does it go? Blah, 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 all that kind of stuff. What was your take on Dan at that time, his personality and how he treated you? No, he seemed pretty, he seemed like a straight shooter, like he was a, a boat captain. He was professional. He was organized. I didn't really think too much of it. I just thought, oh, another guy with playing with a billionaire's toys, you know, or millionaire's toys, you know, one of these guys these boat guys that gets to play with all the goodies you know and i was always kind of envious because i was a young kid and i was like oh i'd love to have something like that one day you know i'd love to be able to play with you know have a big toy a big speedboat at the time when i was a kid i obviously knew that he was there to like he was whether he was a property manager or not i knew he was there looking after the boats the toys he was dan the man he got that name around the marina so a small community so you know he just became known as dan the man but I, I, I didn't really know. Like I said, I was a little, I was a little kid, you know. <laughs> so um, I had other friends of mine that had a, bo- a boat in the marina as well. So I was always down there, and uh, I was hanging out with him. Was, uh, he would take me fishing on his boat whenever he went out. So I loved that. To be honest, going back to the dive shop where Bacon had his two houses originally, where they rich orig- then they brought the Magnum, the speedboat over there. Like I used to live down in the corner there, so I used to do a lot of fishing right by the docks there by the um the small marina by the uh by the dive shop no i hung out with a lot of the divers there because they taught me how to dive and fish and i used to go out with them as well so i was i was on look i was the kid that was trying to get on everybody's boat okay and go fishing no the, the local bahamian guys who worked down at the dive shop i knew all their names so i used to hang out with them go on the boat whenever a charter boat went out like with dive a dive boat i'd go out and go fishing while the divers were diving <laughs> You know, that was me. Nice. So I never went, I never approached Dan then because he was on the other side of the marina. But if he was, if the boat was in Life Key Marina and he was on it and I was there, then I could, you know, talk to him. So I just exchanged fishing stories. I started saying, oh, yeah, I was out the other day and I was here and I caught this or that. And he'd be like, oh, okay, yeah, cool. I was like, I talked to him about his or where he went, if he caught anything. Or I'd always talk fishing to the guys because the guys love fishing. So did I. That was a way to get in or kind of not be the little kind of, kid i just get you know just have something to in common with that was all but dan was always nice to me i mean he never did anything bad to me he wasn't rude or mean in any shape or form so later on i uh later on a friend of mine had a boat in the marina and i used to hang out he was i used to hang out with him all the time and i got older too so i started partying and drinking and all that as well so you know dan was uh i met dan one night on his boat and and then uh, my friend introduced me and says, oh, you know, this is so and so. And I said, oh, yeah, you I said, I know you, you you have you run the you look after bacon stuff. He goes, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I'm his property manager. And I said, yeah, yeah, I know you. And he's like, yeah. And my friend says, oh, you know him? Like looking at me, you know, this kid as well. And he goes, yeah, he's always talking to me about fishing. Yeah. So that's kind of how like, I'd already known Dan before I was introduced through my friend that was hanging out with him socially. because so my friend was a lot older. I was just, a, you know, I was still a kid. I was still 15, 16. This is when I met Kai around the same time. So, um, yeah, Dan was partying with my friend on his boat. But Dan seemed cool. Like, he was relaxed, talking, fishing and stuff. Now, this is all factual. Again, before I say what I'm going to say, I'm just going to say it's factual. I, I, was, I was smoking weed and I was drinking. So, I mean, that was the normal thing to do, as most of the kids did. You know, well, that's at least 
the way I saw it, that was at the time the normal thing to do. So, I mean, I was, I was hanging out in the marina on my friend's boat and I'd be there in the evenings. There'd be some small parties and Dan would be there and, you know, Dan was smoking weed. And I, this is when I was older, like I started 17 ish, you know, 18, that type of age. I got to know Dan a bit more better on a party level because I was older and I was partying. I already knew him. And, you know, as I said, it wasn't just a, I was a kid talking fishing. I was an older kid turning into a man at the time. But as teenagers do, you know, they experiment. So I was experimenting and I was having fun. And, you know, I told you I went to the Millennium Party that night uh, in 2000. I was at Nygaard Key with my my friends uh, and we went back to my friend's boat and we were partying on the boat and he was there and he was doing coke and I tried some, I nearly had a heart attack and I said, no, I'm not doing that again. And, but you know, Dan, Dan, uh, I met Dan, you know, I knew Dan was, uh, by that time I was 19, 20, come 20. So I was old enough to know what was going on. Like I wasn't a little kid anymore. So, I know that Dan is a good man and I don't see, and that doesn't change the way I view him at all. You know, he was still Dan the man, the fisherman, but he was also Dan the man, the party man. <laughs> That's it was his fun. So it's by it. party man, you mean a, a guy that did cocaine with you guys? Oh yeah. And weed and all that drank and everything, you know, but he, he was, uh, he was starting to came, become pretty, pretty popular. And as I think I mentioned, like I put the name to it that, you know, at the time when I kind of left the Bahamas or that was the time I'd left and I moved, uh, my family, but he, uh, to me, he was, you know, the, as I saw, he was the FedEx of cocaine and life for key. He was delivering to the high end, high end users. I personally know from experience of what it's like there. Um, it's a very fantasy based place where there is no concept of reality when you have lots of money and nothing to do there's no drive there's no motivation there's no ambition it it gets removed out of the equation and there's no consequence to anybody's actions in life or key because the gated private community and at the time the police weren't allowed in there life or key had its own security but i mean come on they were kind of a joke i i was very friendly with the guys there they all knew me you know, they'd all ask me for information about drug boats and they you knew I smoked dope. They didn't care. Um, you know, was, basically they weren't uh, working for the government. They were just private security guys, private security guards working for Life or Key Association. So they were paid by all the men, all the millionaires that were living there that were paying club membership. You know, the money was going to pay wages and salaries for the right. operational cost of the key. So all the landscaping, all of the fixing, the maintenance, the golf course, the security. The whole works was being paid for by all the wealthy people living in Life for Key. They were footing the bill, so they were paying for their own privacy. That was the big thing that I realized for myself as well. I mean, like Dan originally, when I met him, he was just, you know, he was fresh in from the States and he was a boat, he was a yachty and he was into his boats and his fishing and his engines and all that. And I never thought that, you know, he would be a party animal. You know, it was uh, anyone who had uh, the freedom and the luxury of living there and the, you know, the no consequences of actions and by even parents finding out, you know, parents would find out that you're out partying or smoking dope or doing this. And they, they would hear rumors and they wouldn't want to believe it, you know, they'd go, oh, he was just having a few drinks or she was drunk or whatever, you know. So people wouldn't, uh, some parents lived in denial a lot. Some, like my dad was always concerned. He didn't like me hanging out and partying. I don't think he really knew about, I, I think he knew, but he didn't say probably. He thought, I, <clears throat> I just smoked a lot. I just smoked weed. So he, he knew I did, but he probably didn't think things were maybe as bad as they were because he also was like, well, you know, if I was in life for key, at least he knew where I was. It was easier to track me down. So he could get in his car and he'd find me. He knew I wasn't out of the key, so at least he preferred. He's like, well, at least he's in the key rather than being outside yeah. and on the other side of the island in a nightclub. But life or key was actually worse, and I'll tell you for a simple reason why. Because you could do whatever you wanted. 
like I said, within the limits, like, you know, I wasn't going out like, and I'll make this very clear. I was never a violent or aggressive person. I was never out to heart or harm anybody. I was never violent. I wasn't out, you know, to get into fights in nightclubs or to take women home and, you know, rip their clothes off. So that wasn't me. I was just, I just wanted to have fun. I could go and party down on the beach or on my friend's boat or at a friend's house. And I didn't have to worry. You know, I, I just had to watch out with the parents where it was the dad or the mom. Some of the dads were more stricter than the moms, you know. Take us from there to him buying the property next to Nygaard and any other um, goings on that you or maybe other people were hypothesizing what was going on. Bacon bought that property by Nygaard and he must have known that about the noise, you know, he's not a fool. So like I said, the parties at Nygaard were... Like in the 90s, they were a new thing. You know, Nygaard was establishing himself there. So the reason I'm talking about Nygaard is because of the noise levels in the parties, because they got worse over the years. They got louder and more often. You know, as I left, I wasn't there. But I know they did, because when I'd go back for a holiday, like I'd be at my friend's house and I could hear the party from the beach. So the speakers were loud, you know, and this wasn't bacon speakers. This wasn't bacon's military grade speakers to deflect the sound. This was Nygaard's speakers that he was using. So music came fairly clear out of Nygaard Key and it, it, it was echoing across the bay. There's a bay there and it, all the sound travels and echoes in there. Like I said, uh, I never went to Bacon's place. I'm still going to Nygaard Key, but the funny thing is Dan, who was working for Bacon, who had just moved to Bacon, had just bought a property next to Nygaard with all the noise. You know, at the time, it was a bit odd. Like, you know, why would you move next to a party maniac? But no, none of the other neighbors complained because they, everyone else got invited to Nygaard's. Anyone living down close to Nygaard Key was invited. So by the time Bacon moved next door to Nygaard, Nygaard had been there for 20 years. Yeah. And that's the thing. He had president, like president of the legal president that like, for example, any noise levels, like there's a lot of laws regarding this and. You know, the uh, the Bahamian government, uh, you know, Bahamas became independent in 1973. So it's a British, it's a British colony colonized by the Brits. So the law is UK based, just like it is, you know, a lot of com colonies are the, the law is the president from laws is from UK cases. So, you know, any noise there, like if there wasn't a certain amount of complaints within a certain time period in the early days, then you know, uh, Life for Key Security and the Property Owners Association would have told Nygaard, you know, you got it. But the thing is, you see, technically there's Nygaard Key isn't in Life for Key. It is in Life for Key, but it, it, the land that it's on, it belongs to the Bahamian government. But Nygaard never bought that land. It's called Sims, po not Sims Point, I think, or Sims Key, Sims Point. So Sims Point doesn't belong it was never bought by the like the actual property owners like the guy who started life for key was a canadian guy nygaard when he bought that property he took a lease from the bahamian government but he had to get into life for key gates and through life for key in order to get that was the only access point unless he got in unless he drove in by boat so as you drove down that towards the end of clifton bay at the very top point there you had to drive in through a gate into nygaard key but the P Property Owners Association of Lyford Key didn't have legally have any rights to say anything over that property because that deal was done between Nygaard and the government. They, he leased that property from the government for them to be able to enforce any of their laws or any of their rules. You know, basically, he could tell them to go fish if you catch right. my drift. The property Sims Key is not under the Property Association of Lyford Key. You know, it's. It's not their property. They don't have. They don't own the land. You know, they don't have any rights right. to it. So Nygaard had one a leverage there. Now both, as I said previously, Nygaard and Bacon didn't get technically the permission to build or extend. You know, the properties. You know, Bacon like originally like Nygaard Key was very rocky. There wasn't a lot of sand there, and it's very exposed to the water and the currents and the storms and the hurricanes and the reefs and. So, I mean, on the backside of Nygaard Key, he started dredging and pumping sand to, you know, build a barrier and extend the beach as well. On the north side, he put up a barrier, you know, a rock barrier to break the waves. So to protect his property that he was building. And I don't blame him. I mean, I just would have gone about it legally. I would have asked permission. I mean, Bacon went and did the same thing. But if you look on a map, you can see Bacon's little marina that he built 
was was illegally built, as far as I know, as well, and he never got into trouble. So it's it's it seems very it's very hypocritical, though. It's you know it's okay for Bacon to build a little marina in his house, and uh, Nygaard had the same style marina, you know, for boats to come in and park. Two big boats and two boats Nygaard had, and but so it wasn't okay for Nygaard. You see, it, the thing is, I think the point is, it was still illegal. And Nygaard's, uh, Nygaard did it on a larger scale. Bacon did it on a smaller scale, but he still did it illegally. So they're both wrong. But that's the only thing wrong that can be proved. You know, the environmental factors that the dredging would have caused in the water, the reefs, the marine life, the fauna, all that, you know, around that area. You know, when I used to go diving around um, Nygaard Key, there's just some reefs out there as well. And you know, you could see like the sand, like it, it, it dropped off very quick before it would like le- it leveled out. Like it was uh, very like inclined, like it would go very far out and it wasn't that deep for a while. But then once he pumped up all the sand and built up the backside of Niger Key and built that huge beach that he has, um, it, the water line just dropped straight down. You know, and you can see the effects of the dredging. Going back, I'll tell you something that I have looked at. Because Dan was involved in drugs, obviously, I was wondering, like, where is he getting them from? You know, because he's a, think about it, he's a, he's an American white guy on the island. So, but there are a lot of white guys on the island and a lot of them do have connections. So, you know, it's hard to say exactly where his source was. Um, I didn't spend enough time around him. And at the time I knew him, he was more of a party animal type guy. He was more chilled and relaxed and the cool, he was like a cool dude, you know, but, um, right. So it kind of took away from his professional edge that he may have had when I met him when he was when I was younger and he was younger in the early 90s. So, you know, I looked at that marina that uh, I've looked at the marina a few times that Bacon has built a little slip. Now, to be honest, you've got to look at this purely like with logistics and size. I, the boat like the the Magnum disappeared, whether he sold it or whatever, it was no longer there. But. This, the marina that Bacon built next to uh, Bygar Key, where I said where it was illegally dredged, he didn't get permission to do that either. There's a, a there's a dock that goes under his house. So when you go into the little in, into the marina, which is a slip on the backside, you can turn right and you can park your boats under the house. Okay, but I've looked at the picture in more detail, and in order to get a larger boat in, you'd have because the you need a larger boat. In order to run drugs, you know, you need a, you know, good 40, 50 foot boat. You could run smaller, but in order to run the big loads, you need a larger boat with larger length, larger width, larger engines, uh, larger fuel capacity in the tanks. You need all that, you know, because you've got a lot of rough water you have to deal with as well. And you need the speed and you need the strength of a large hull. So all the all the numbers have to add up here. So with all due respect, It'd be very difficult because you need a bigger entrance because I've looked at the pictures into that slip in that in that marina he's built. And you need to be able to fit a larger boat in there. Now, whether he was involved in running stuff before, I don't know. He could have run it on that Magnum. That is possible. That boat in the early 90s, because there were there it wasn't just him. There were other speedboats coming into Lightford Key Marina, and they were the fountains, and they were the cigarettes, and they were the scarabs. Those are the speedboats. They are built for speed. And they had the outboards, three or four outboards on them, you know, with 250, 300 horsepower. On, you know, they might be carrying seven, 800 horsepower, some of them. And these things are flying. Not literally, but they're going as fast as you can go right. you know, without capsizing the boat. Because obviously you've got to balance out the weight on the boat. So you've got the drugs up in the front, okay? And you've got the, ga- you've got the engines in the back and you're, you've got your fuel tank somewhere in the middle on the port and ba- on the port's starboard side balancing the weight. It's all engineering. It's all mass. It's all grab a bit of physics as well, because you've got to balance the weight of it. You've got these big engines. You've got to got fuel tanks. You've got to have big fuel tanks for the long distance. And then you've got to have, you know, storage capacity. So you've got to weigh down the front. So you need to balance the weight on the boat. You know, it needs to be dispersed evenly. You can't just throw everything on one side. And, you know, you have too much weight and the boat's off keel. You know, my tip on you. You know, all these boat guys are smart. That's all, but this is all basic stuff for boating, like guys who would be running drugs. Like, and that's why I said, like, some of my friends who, like, the guys who were in security, uh, like for key security, they'd ask me, oh, yeah, if you see anything or hear anything, will you tell me? But I never would say anything about that. I mean, I, I saw numerous boats come in that were obviously suspicious. 
you know, they come in and fuel up and they'd speed out again, you know, and they could run off to Miami or Fort Lauderdale. Like I said, I never saw, I never actually saw any of these transactions with my own eyes. I mean, like, to be honest, I never saw Dan sell drugs. Right. Okay. I never saw him give, um, receive money for cocaine. I never saw a physical exchange, but uh, like I said, I know, I know a close friend of mine who was, uh, liked his cocaine and uh, Dan was hanging around him a lot. And I was partying with them a lot. I knew he was getting it from, it's, you know, it's obvious it's the latest day. I'm there in the same boat. The owner of the boat is going down the bathroom, you know, and coming back with powder on his nose. And so's uh, and this other guy as well is, is there with him. And he's got a big bag of it. Two plus two is equal to four, you know. Then, then did, I did see him with large quantities of drugs. So, I mean, he wasn't walking around with a big bag of coke and a few ounces of grass for personal use, you know. I mean, I, 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 like, I like to keep a lot of weed on me as well, but I always smoked it all with my friends. So, um, but, you know, the coke is something that I didn't really know too much about at the time. I was a kid and I was growing up and I used it with, I, I used it there, um, you know, with Dan a couple of times, but I got violently sick with it at the time. So it turned me off the drug because mm -hmm. I didn't get sick if I smoked marijuana. I just felt relaxed and happy. I didn't like the effects of the coke. Obviously, it was very pure. It was very strong, and I had never tried it before. And I took too much of it, of course, but um, I didn't know the effects on my, on how it would affect me at the time. That's all I really can say because I, I you know, I could I could hide, hypothesize on whether mm -hmm. Bacon Bacon was running drugs, but I don't know. You know, I just don't know. I just, you know, the the two, first two houses he had were. The marina, the dive shop, there was too many people. There were too many boats coming in and out. And then he moved to Nygaard Key. You know, it sounds like he's looking for privacy, maybe. You know, and he, the big boat goes, the new canal that he builds illegally. He can't fit the, a proper size boat. Sure, you could still get a small speedboat in there. But, you know, in order to deal with the ocean and the waves and the currents and the chop and all that, you, you wouldn't be able to move a lot of product in the smaller boat. And it'd be highly risky in the open waters. And Dan knew that. Dan became a kind of a victim of the lifestyle. Like he wasn't a millionaire. He wasn't a billionaire. He was working for a billionaire, but he was very privileged because you guys know that longer there, but I did have discussions with Dan uh, while I was partying with him. I mean, one night, I mean, I was on the boat and I was actually staying on a friend's boat and Dan was there and, you know, we were smoking joints and I think I did a bit coke that night as well. Mm -hmm. And we were he was telling me, oh, yeah, you know, um, Bacon sent his financial guys or the accountants down on the jet. And there was some Playboy girls, there's some escorts some down there. And they, they f them and they got bored of them and they sent them home. And, you know, they wanted to do a pile of blow. And so, right. so you know, Dan, like, it wasn't hiding this for me. Dan was telling me, yeah, you know, Bacon sends his guys down there, his financial guys, they go to blow off some steam for a weekend, which is perfect place. You know, no, his obviously Bacon's family wasn't there. His wife or kids weren't at the house. And Dan was there looking after the house. Obviously there were a couple of people working landscaping and maybe a maid or a cook. And Dan was just picking them up and making sure they got entertained. So Dan would make sure he, they had the Coke and the weed and, you know, and the girls would be flown in and they'd be fucked and they'd be sent off. And, I remember him telling me a story. Oh yeah, the account. Some one of the accountants was down. Because oh man, you you should see the girls that came down. They were awesome. They were like Playboy models, and you know he just they were like they were cost them like ten grand for the day or something, and they flew them in and whatever the amount of money was, I can't remember exactly, but it was something like that. And this was back in the you know late nineties, early two thousands, twenty years ago. So I just said to me that oh yeah, you'd love to see these ones, and I was like yeah yeah, come on, take me take me take me back. I was oh no, they're gone. What do you mean? You're, you're kind of like building up a story telling me, you know, you know, you could take me back and let me have some fun with them. He goes, oh, no, they just came in for the day and they had their fun. They, the accountants had their fun with the with the escorts and that were flown in the Playboy models and they were gone. And then they just partied and had their business meetings and then they were gone back to New York. So, you know, that's what those what that's what have come out of Dan's mouth. You know, he would have told me this, you know. So Dan was responsible for entertaining Bacon's close inner circle, his financial team, when they came down. And these guys, these guys in New York all love the party. They love escorts, 
hookers. They love and blow. That's, you know, all these fucking banker type guys. That's why these city, cities never sleep. Most of these bankers are out snorting and fucking all night. And what's wrong with doing well, You know, they just had a private place to do it in a mansion in a guarded area where, hey, no one's going to no one's going to bother them. All I know is, like, I don't want to get on to, like, you know, whatever I've said to you, I've backed up. Okay. Back. Yeah. Yeah, I got you. Know? you. So let's first go to Dan. What I'd like to say about Dan again is I'll miss him. He's a nice guy. I had fun with him. Um, always good memories. Unfortunately, he died in a hot tub. Now, as soon as I heard that, I, I said, geez, I said, you know, there's the rumors of where he, he was killed, you know, after, in retaliation, he was murdered poisoned because of Nygaard Key going up in flames. And Dan, and I'll say this again, Dan was never a violent man. Never. Dan was too, Dan was too high. Like, Dan, literally, Dan was too high and too Mr. Cool Dude. To, like, he was not a violent guy. Like, I know he's got that kind of military, or a marine type background. Dan could swim, he could fish, but Dan got lazier in his old years. Dan wasn't in the same good shape. I mean, I was in great shape. I was young. I was fit. I was diving in the water, free diving a lot, you know. And but Dan grew old and he got lazy, and that's a party lifestyle. Okay. Mm -hmm. So Dan was never aggressive. And he was never angry. Dan was too self-medicated to go in to destroy Nygaard Key. So unless Bacon had somebody do it, maybe some Marines or contracted somebody from the CIA, maybe he had CIA connections. I don't know. Um, that's a possibility. I don't like to, you know, that's a, that's, that's purely skeptical there, yeah. you know, but, uh, Dan, I immediately, I, I thought Dan had overdied more, you know, more probability on he, he died from cocaine heart. He, it even said that there was, um, coronary, something with a coronary heart thing in the article. So I would, if I was bet on it, I put my money, it was Coke. He just did too much. The heat and the water, he just... He just hit it too hard one night, you know, whether he was given a bad batch, like, you know, whether, and there's this other, like, well, this is theory, right? So this is not factual. Now, as I said, whether ba maybe Bacon was running Coke and maybe Dan got into it that way and he started using it and he got addicted to it and nobody was around and he started selling it. That was my other theory. Dan was running it for Bacon. And maybe Bacon was, the reason Bacon was making these types of return is, A, Bacon was trading on insider trading. And he also originally, when he started the fund, he only like the rumor I heard, or not the rumor, but yeah, it says on the internet he got twenty five thousand from his parents. But then I heard from another source, very good source of mine, that his boss, who started him off, gave him a million dollars to test him and say, "Let's see how you do. I'll give you a million dollars." So, is it did his parents give him twenty five thousand, or did his old boss give him a million? So I don't know. Or did some somebody approach him who needed some money laundered? And look, it's it's a tough business. You need a lot of capital starting that hedge fund stuff. You, you know, the more you have, the better, the more weight you can move, the more things you can swing, as in the shares. You know, but still, he's he still take risks any day. But maybe he was doing a little bit of everything. Maybe I think he, I think he was a smart guy. I think he learned to find opportunities. You know, you know when markets crashed and when they went up and down. I think he learned to capitalize on certain things. I think he made some money clean. I think, I think to, my thoughts are this, and this is purely my thoughts. I, I can't back this up, but I think he, he got, I think someone in the States or wherever, I think approached him and said, yeah, I've got some money, but, and he was maybe struggling to start off his fund, but it, it was, it, the money was, it was money that would needed to be laundered. Like it was laundered, but maybe it was drug money in the States and he needed to like, it was easier to launder in the States instead of ship the cash back out. Okay. So if they could launder it through certain entities in the States, they would wash the money through his hedge fund. But also, too, he would do insider trading. That's how he was able to do such astounding returns uh, consistently for 30 years. That was my theory. So he had possible insider trading, and then he was doing legitimate deals, but maybe he was also laundering the seed capital. Like he told two years ago, he shut down, and he, he blamed the equity markets you know, were very thin. It was right. very hard to raise equity. And uh, why did he all of a sudden need to raise more equity? He already had like $10 billion in his fund. Like his resume speaks for him. He's been trading for 30 years. He's averaging 17.8% per year, over 30 years. And that's right. suspicious. I'd be, I'd be like, well, why are you closing your fund? I'll give you some money. I'll help you. 
I'll move my fund. My the other funds aren't getting me that. They're only getting me seven or eight or ten percent. But you know, I'll, I'll give you some money and see how you do. You know, and then I'll give you some more. So he would have built up a reputation unless he had a Ponzi scheme or he had a problem. Unless the in, unless the cartel or the drug guys he were involved with, maybe they pulled the plug on him and maybe they said, look, um, after Dan's death, you know, and he apparently had the year after Dan's death, he was going to sell that mansion for thirty five million. So you know, he had Dan's body cremated within forty eight hours. So the evidence was gone. Okay. So, you, you know, that was taken care of. And then, you know, he puts a house up for sale for 35 million a year after. And then in two, and that was 2010, Dan died. 2011, he put the house up for sale. I don't know if he sold it. I think it's still there. And then in 2018, he shuts down his fund all of a sudden and says the money markets have dried up. It's hard to raise equity. When you're in fund business for 30 years and you're nearly, nearly pumping out 20% a year, that's odd. That doesn't add up. You know, I'm just being simple with the numbers, like where two plus two should equal four. But, you know, it doesn't in this case to me. I can't right. prove it. But, you know, I, I think there's a hybrid or cocktails of things going on where the guy is, you know, he got some seed, dirty seed capital. And maybe the cartel, maybe they pulled out. Maybe they said there's too much heat around you or, you know, this whole bacon niger between you two is blown up. You know, and this was this is funny time because this is just about the same time. With all the problems between Bacon and Nygaard in the Bahamas, Nygaard goes to court. Bacon drag, you know, gets him into court for saying, "Oh, you know, whatever with the property, and you dredged this, and you didn't get permission." And Bacon did the same thing. So Nygaard says, "Oh, this is bullshit," and he basically gives the finger to the Bahamian government, and the court get pissed off, and they put an arrest warrant out for him. Yeah. So then Bacon, Bacon gets to corner. But this, around the same time, Bacon closed his fund. And said that liquidity and equity markets were difficult. So maybe, maybe, maybe Bacon got caught up in this feud with Nygaard and the Colombians got pissed off with him and said, you're drawing too much heat attention here, blah, blah, blah. Obviously, you know, these cartel guys, if they were behind him, maybe they wanted their money out. Maybe he had to cash them out. So maybe he said, maybe he was forced to do it. Maybe he said, he goes, look, you know, I have to cash out here and then. He's complaining, well, why can't he go to other people? And other investors will say, well, whose money were you managing? Technically, he doesn't have to disclose that. But maybe they were looking for references. Maybe he couldn't give it to them. Maybe he didn't want to give it to them because he can't give it to them. So mm -hmm. he just coincidentally closes his fund. I can say what I want. and like I have to be able to back it up. But I'm saying I'm just trying to go on basic information that we have access to in chronological order and say, why would a guy who's running a hedge fund for 30 years and making nearly 20% a year all of a sudden have 10 billion under management and say, I'm sorry, I, I have to close my fund down because he's blaming that he can't raise money from equity markets? At the same time, he's having this huge feud with Mr. Uh, Mr. Nygaard? It doesn't make sense. And then all of a sudden, Nygaard gets, you know, Nygaard has to leave the Bahamas, otherwise, he's going to get arrested. And then a, a, a trafficking lawsuit comes out of New York to hit Nygaard and the FBI raid Nygaard's headquarters in New York. You know, why, why would a U.S. citizen, a hedge fund, a super hedge fund billionaire, have want to have a place in life or key? Yeah, and a guy who knows how to handle his money, why is he mishandling it, right? Yeah, well, you know, he has, he can afford to have all these houses, but really people who live in life or key, like, they're mostly Europeans and um, Canadian uh, multimillionaires and high net worth individuals that don't have to pay taxes. So, I mean, you know, they're there for a reason. They're there to legally hide their assets offshore because the, all the tax structures are in place in that jurisdiction to allow them to achieve that objective legally. So for Bacon to spend 35, you know, millions and millions on property there and boats and all this stuff, it doesn't add up doesn't make sense for him to do what he's doing to have a place in the Bahamas at all. Yeah, right. why move next to the party animal? You know? And I, I think what happened was that he was involved. I think he was doing insider trading. I think he got seed capital from some dirty money. He laundered some coke money. And I think the guys who were like, well, they trusted him at first. And, you know, this guy's just a money man. He's just laundering their money. And, and then he's doing trades. And he's doing some illegal trade, you know, insider trading. And then he's also, um, and he's also doing some little legitimate tracks and transactions, but I think they pulled the plug on him. I think at yeah. the time that Nygaard um, and him got into a feud, I think that got the better of him. They, they got pissed off and they pulled the plug and they said, look, we, we want our money back. You're done. We're going to move our money somewhere else. And that's it.
So he was basically forced to shut the fund because most of the capital is going out of it. And that's why he closed it. He, he blamed equity markets, but the real, but I think the real truth, and people can't say, oh, that's your truth, but you have to ask yourself the motive. Why would you close a fund like that after 30 years? I mean, he has a choice. He could wind it up into a, a private family office where he's just managing his own money in it and just pay back investors. Why isn't he doing that? He's beat the stock market 30, 30 years in a row and made, made about 18%. 17.8%. That's what the numbers say. So unless the numbers are wrong, to be honest with you, there, there, most people who trade, they shouldn't even touch, stop, touch a stock or share in their life. Even if they have an education in it, you know, this guy's not a drug money, a drug guy. He doesn't know anything about that. He's just kind of a money mule, you know? Right. So I think, I think he was being, I think, I think he was using, uh, I think he was being used as well and he needed the money to start with. But I think at the same time with that feud with Nygaard probably made this, uh, his investors want to pull the plug on him and say, no, you're, you're done. You have to transfer the money out. Now, he could have, instead of using the excuse of, oh, you know, the, the equity markets have dried up, it's hard to raise capital. He could have just said, I'm, I'm turning it into a family, a family office, which means you give back your investors money and all the money you would have made. Like he's worth a couple billion, like at least 1.8 billion by now or right. two, whatever it is. He could have left that in his fund. And just given back the balance of the investor's money and still traded his own money and then tried to raise some more money. But as I said, again, if he had tried to raise some more money, then he wouldn't be a family business. So it's just very suspicious that, like, you know, this guy was one of the top 20 fund managers in the world and he's yeah. doing it consistently for 20, 30 years. So I, I don't believe it all. I think it's all bull, you know, but, you know, I don't have any direct proof. All I can say is sure. the numbers don't add up from, you know, that period of time. I just don't see it. My precious little princess. My precious little princess. Kayla. Kayla. What? Huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla. Kayla. What? Huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla. Mourn. Kayla. What? Huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla, mourn. Kayla, okay, well, the, 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 but, huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla, mourn. Kayla, okay, well, the, 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 but, huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla, mourn. Kayla, okay, well, the, 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 but, huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla, I, Kayla, I, would you go for this? Come here, but, huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla, mourn. Kayla, okay, well, the, 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 but, huh? Mm -hmm. Kayla, I, Kayla, I, would you go for this? Come here, but, huh? Mm -hmm. My, my, my precious little princess, princess, huh? Princess, mm -hmm. my, my, my precious little princess, princess, huh? Princess, Kayla, I, you sound so, would you go for this? You sound so, hi. Kayla, I, you sound so, would you go for this? You sound so, hi. My, my, my precious little princess.
Yeah. Would you go, baby? Come here. Okay, hang on a second. <laughs> 